Well, we are here tonight to study from the book of Acts, and we are heading toward the second half of Acts chapter 23 tonight. So if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to get that out and meet me in Acts chapter 23. I think we're starting in verse 16 in just a few minutes. So hope to meet you there. Hope you're doing well this week. Looks like some possible snow coming in. So I'm looking forward to that for the rest of this week if that happens. But I uh, hope you can turn to Acts 23. We'll get to that in just a moment. And I also hope to see you for worship this coming Sunday at either 9 or 11 a.m. And also for the Bible class in between at 10, we're continuing looking at the exploits of King David. So we've had some interesting studies so far. Oh, with David and Goliath and Saul before that and the issues there. And I think right now we're working through uh, David's friendship with Jonathan. So some neat studies there. Hope to see you this coming Sunday for class at 10 and then worship at either 9 or 11. If you can join us for one of those two worship services, I still hope you can sign up using the Sign Up Genius account. That really helps. And uh, that's uh, you get the link by email on Saturday. Or feel free to go there now if you've got that bookmark and know how to get there. But we would appreciate that very much. Uh, for those of you who were joining us on the phone one week ago, you might have noticed that it was a rerun. We accidentally uploaded the wrong week. And those who were joining us online on the computer, they you guys got the right one. But those of you joining us on the phone had one that was a week old. And so I was referring last week to it being the day before Thanksgiving and all that. So if that was... Uh, sounding like a repeat to you, that was not me repeating myself, that was an accident, and uh, it wasn't your problem either. But uh, that new class has been uploaded, I think when you dial in, if you want to catch up, feel free to do that, but I think there's an option number two where you can choose past classes and past worship services, and I think that one was uploaded last Friday. So if you need any help with that, as I said Sunday, ask anybody by the name of Silas. And they should be able to help you out there. So I hope you can join us this coming Sunday. And we're looking forward to getting back into Acts chapter 23 tonight. So uh, tonight, again, we are working our way through Acts, the book of gospel action. It's written by Luke, the, the beloved physician, as Paul refers to him in Colossians. And he's writing to a man by the name of Theophilus. And he's giving him a history of the early church. So the book of Luke is the life of Christ, covering roughly 30 years, 33 and a half years or so. And then Luke picks up, uh, Luke leaves off, and then Acts picks up where Luke leaves off. And we continue on with the establishment of the church in chapter 2 and moving on through the ministries of Peter and Paul. So that's where we are. By way of very brief review, uh, we've assigned a successive letter of the uh, English alphabet for each chapter in the book of Acts, kind of as a memory tool. This is something that has been incredibly helpful to me through the years, just a valuable tool. If you're wondering where something is in the book of Acts, often this will help you remember it. So up to this point, we've looked at the ascension in chapter 1, then the beginning of the church, carried and cured, determined disciples, empty jail, first deacons with the question mark, great hero, how can I, I am Jesus, journey to Joppa, kingdom includes Gentiles, liberated again, missionary sent out, not gods but men, old law not binding, Philippian jailer converted, questions answered in Athens, reasoning with a preacher, saving our religious friends, Troas on the Lord's Day, uproar in Jerusalem, valuable citizenship, and tonight we are continuing with the rest of Acts chapter 23, which is waiting to kill Paul. And by way of very brief review, Paul has been arrested, falsely accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple in Jerusalem, a mob forms. So this is the uproar in Jerusalem. Paul is then rescued by the Romans. This is his valuable citizenship, which saves him from getting scourged or flogged by the Romans. And the next day, he's given a chance to make his defense before the Jewish council. And he faces the council. He sees that it will be impossible to win an argument with these men. They are not being reasonable. And so he decides to turn them against one another. So he appeals to the resurrection of the dead. Some believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees do. The Sadducees do not. And so he creates a division among these men. Uh, he is rescued again by the Romans. But right at the end of our study last week, more than 40 Jewish men take an oath, a solemn oath before God, that they will neither eat nor drink until they have killed Paul. And the chief priests are in on it. Uh, their plan is to have the chief priests tell the Romans they need to examine Paul again more carefully. And so their plan is they will kill him as he is being transported. So that was our cliffhanger last week. We left off with Acts chapter 23, verse 15. And so we'll pick up tonight with Acts 23. And the first paragraph is verses 16 through 21. Acts chapter 23, verses 16 through 22, actually. Acts 23, 16 through 22. But the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush 
And he came and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Lead this young man to the commander, for he has something to report to him. So he took him and led him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to lead this young man to you since he has something to tell you. The commander took him by the hand and stepping aside began to inquire of him privately. What is it that you have to report to me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down tomorrow to the council, as though they were going to inquire somewhat more thoroughly about him. So do not listen to them, for more than forty of them are lying in wait for him, who have bound themselves under oath not to eat or drink until they slay him. And now they are ready and waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man go, instructing him, Tell no one that you have notified me of these things. Up in verse 16, we learn several things, starting with the fact that Paul has a sister. And I don't think we've learned this before about the Apostle Paul. This is a first for us in the book of Acts. We don't know very much at all about Paul's earthly family, other than obviously the fact that they were also Jewish, as he was, so they also would have been from the tribe of Benjamin, just as he was. Uh, we have a brief reference to Paul's physical family. Over in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, and his feelings toward them. So I'll just kind of insert Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5 here. He says, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. So if you think about that passage I just read from Romans 9, uh, that isn't specifically about Paul's immediate family, his sisters and brothers, that kind of thing. But in a way, it, it kind of is. So as he thinks about his own obedience to the gospel personally, he is torn up over the fact that his kinsmen, according to the flesh, have not yet made that decision. And so I'm, he's thinking of people that he knows. So his closest relatives, I think we would say, his kinsmen, according to the flesh, is the way he words it there. And when he thinks about the fact that he's been baptized, he's obeyed the gospel, but they haven't, he says that it gives him great sorrow and unceasing grief in his heart. And I think most of us have similar feelings, don't we, for our own loved ones who are uh, have not yet obeyed the gospel? Or maybe brothers, sisters, fathers, children who maybe have obeyed the gospel, but they're no longer faithful to the Lord and his church. So they've maybe fallen away for whatever reason. And so I think we would agree that for most of us, I mean, it, it absolutely tears us up emotionally. We are just... Uh, anguished over that. And I just mentioned that here because this is where we learn that Paul has a sister. And he also has a nephew, doesn't he? You know I'm not good with anything beyond mother, father, brother, sister, but I, I think this is his nephew as far as I can uh, calculate if I've reasoned through this correctly. We don't know the age of this young man uh, other than the fact that he is described as being a young man. So there's no date of birth. There's no age given. He's old enough to speak up, isn't he? So he's old enough to explain what's going on here. He's overheard something. He knows that Paul needs to hear this, so he has the courage to go and visit Paul in his little imprisonment here. But at the same time, although he's old enough to do that, he's also young enough to be led and taken by the hand. So the soldier leads him by the hand in this passage. So in my mind, maybe 10, maybe 11 years old, give or take a few years. I mean, any younger, he might not be speaking up like this, and any older, he wouldn't be led by the hand. So does that make sense to you? Um, there's kind of this little window in here where he's old enough to say something, but young enough to be led by the hand. You don't kind of lead a 16, 17-year-old by the hand, but, you know, you get down to 7 or 8, and that's really maybe not old enough to speak up as this young man did. So somewhere in the middle there, 10 or 11 years old, very roughly. So Paul has a nephew, and he's very, he's very courageous, isn't he? And that's what amazes us in this passage, the courage of this young man. So this young man hears about this ambush, and it seems that on his own, he comes into the barracks. He tells Paul down in verse 16. So he has some 
some pretty amazing courage here. He also loves his Uncle Paul. I think that's very accurate to say here. He loves his uncle. And this is where I wonder about uh, whether some of Paul's family, whether they have obeyed the gospel at this point. At least some of them, perhaps, that is a remote possibility. Um, if they still see Paul as a traitor of some kind, you know, I kind of wonder why they would speak up like this. If, if they really have harsh feelings toward him, maybe they wouldn't be intervening here, but they do, at least the young man does. So I don't know, but uh, I would not be too surprised to learn that uh, someday when we meet Paul, that uh, Paul had perhaps converted his own sister, or at least some of his family. Again, uh, we're not told, this is just speculation on our part, but the fact that his sister's son speaks up like this at least makes this consider uh, this uh, as a possibility. Well, upon hearing this report, uh, Paul gets one of the centurions and has him lead this young man to the commander. And really, the fact that the centurion listens to Paul as a prisoner uh, indicates that the Romans have a newfound respect for Paul. I think that would be an accurate thing to say here. I don't know if guards in a prison would always take these things seriously, uh, but this man does. And so he has some kind of relationship. There's some kind of respect for Paul going on here. Remember, they had almost beat him as a Roman citizen without a trial. So in a way, Paul kind of has something on them. And I don't know, um, maybe using this to his advantage, but it's in their best interest to treat Paul fairly and to treat him well. And the centurion then takes Paul's nephew to the commander. And what I love here is that the commander takes this young man by the hand. He steps aside with him and he talks to him privately. And I'm trying to picture this in my mind, what that looks like, what, what actually happened here. And to me, at least, this commander has some experience, doesn't he? And not just as a commander of troops. He's not some battle-hardened Roman soldier with no feelings and and not having a, a real life, but at least to me, I see this man as a father, or maybe even as a grandfather at this point, to be in command of so many troops there in the city of Jerusalem. But, uh, you know, this man knows how to talk to a kiddo, doesn't he? he? He seems to have some experience here. So he takes him by the hand, brings him aside. This is not something they're doing publicly in front of dozens or hundreds of other people, but he takes them, him aside in private. And what I also notice is he asks him an open-ended question. So this is not a, a yes or no question, uh, but this is asking for the report in his own words. So, you know, tell me what's going on here. Not, is there a plot, yes or no, but more, tell me what's going on. And the nephew explains the plot, and he explains it very clearly and concisely. And yet, at the same time, there is a sense of urgency here. So this is not something we can slack on, but this is something that you need to know. So there's a level of maturity. Uh, the commander lets him go, ordering him not to tell anyone that he's notified the commander of these things. And that's interesting to me as well. If the young man had told others that he had reported this, the 40 men might have had a chance to change their plans and to go about this in a different way. And so the commander wants to deal with this plot, not some new and improved other plot. Uh, this is a plot he can handle as long as he knows that this is what he's actually dealing with, not something else. So don't tell anybody that you've told me. Don't have them change their plans. Don't give them a chance to do that. But we want them to do this. We want them to do this thing. We want them to try this thing that they're planning on doing, not something else. So we want to deal with them um, as this, this happens here. Um, so let's continue with Acts 23, verses 23 through 30, the next paragraph. Acts 23. 23 through 30. And he called to him two of the centurions and said, Get 200 soldiers ready by the third hour of the night to proceed to Caesarea with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. They were also to provide mounts to put Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter having this form. Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor Felix greetings. When this man was arrested by the Jews and was about to be slain by them, I came up to them with the troops and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And wanting to ascertain the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council, and I found him to be accused over questions about their law, but under no accusation deserving death or imprisonment. When I was informed that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, 
also instructing his accusers to bring charges against him before you. In verse 23, the commander calls two of his centurions, and he has a plan, doesn't he? So he's a, a wise man. He's a man who gets things done. He has a plan for a show of overwhelming force. And I think one thing I notice here that uh, he calls two centurions and says, get 200 soldiers ready. So a centurion is a man in charge of 100 soldiers. So two centurions, 200 troops. We have 40 men, Jewish men, who've taken a vow. And so the, so the commander here responds with a plan to remove Paul from Jerusalem completely. So they will move him immediately. They will move him by night. They will take him to Caesarea, a heavily fortified Roman outpost. And they will do this using 470 well-armed and highly trained Roman soldiers. So 200 foot soldiers, 70 horsemen, and then in addition to this, 200 spearmen. Not only will these men uh, be able to easily defeat 40 Jewish men, but the show of force will almost certainly prevent those 40 Jewish men from even trying anything. So it's not just, uh, let's match them. We'll, they want to send 40, we'll send 40, we'll make it a fair fight. No, this is not going to be a fair fight. And uh, I've talked to police officers today in the uh, Citizen Academy a number of years ago. You guys know I went through that. And uh, that's what they explained in their use of force training. Um, the goal is not for police to have a fair fight with a bad guy. They need to take it one level up. They need to be safe. And so that's, there's more control there. End up, uh, most people end up uh, uh, safer as a result of that. So I think we see something similar with this commander. He's not making it fair. He's sending in this overwhelming force to hopefully prevent the 40 Jewish men from even doing what they plan on doing. So it's hard for me to even imagine using 470 well-armed soldiers to transport uh, one prisoner. But the stakes are incredibly high in this situation, aren't they? So we've already had at least two riots over Paul, and the commander cannot afford to lose this prisoner. If he does, he'll have to answer for it because he's in his custody. I should also add that in addition to the 470, they also provide mounts to put Paul on in verse 24. So there's even beyond the 470, we have at least a few others. Uh, so the commander then is, is moving the problem of Paul up the chain of command. So as I would put it, tag, you're it. You know, Felix, you, you, can, you can deal with this now. It's not my problem, it's yours. So they're doing this to keep Paul safe. And I would emphasize here, it's not because the commander sees that Paul's done anything wrong. It's actually the opposite of that. Um, they're kind of protecting him from the Jewish people, and we see this in this passage. Uh, putting a map on a screen here showing the distance from Jerusalem to Caesarea as being just over 68 miles on journey on, a, on foot. Uh, this journey would take a bit more than 22 hours, so Google Maps says 22 hours, 25 minutes. So very roughly, this would be about like us walking from Madison to Waukesha, Wisconsin. And it is possible, isn't it? We've got the glacial Drumlin Trail um, that joins up. I think there's still a missing link between Madison and Cottage Grove, roughly, but we almost have a bike trail going all the way. But if we could imagine just walking from Madison to Waukesha, it's roughly 68 miles here. So it is walkable. It would take almost an entire day on foot. So 22 hours, 25 minutes. So nearly 24 hours of walking. But if you walked it straight through, we could do it. Uh, before they send Paul to Caesarea, though, the commander needs to explain the situation to his higher-ups on the receiving end. So they can't just send a prisoner without an explanation. <laughs> um, here is this guy. Deal with it. They, they need to know why is he here. So there needs to be a document of some kind. So the commander then, he writes this letter and addresses it to Governor Felix. And this has to be one of the most diplomatically worded letters of all time. I mean, the commander gives his name, so it's, there's a formality to it. This is the style of ancient letters. It almost sounds like a letter that Paul might write. I, Paul, write to you, Titus, that kind of thing. So he puts his name here at the beginning. This is who it's from. He addresses this letter to the most excellent governor, Felix. And this is why we think that Theophilus, the first reader of this book, might have been a government official. And I know we've mentioned this a few times, but we finally get here. So in Luke 1, 3, Luke addresses volume 1 to the most excellent Theophilus. Well, here Felix is described as being most excellent Felix. And so some have assumed based on this that Theophilus might have also been some kind of Roman government official as well because the titles are similar. So this is perhaps the custom of the time to address some kind of government leader as most excellent. So we aren't certain of this, 
Uh, but it is an interesting parallel because it's a rather unusual phrase. It's a phrase that we don't really use today. Um, and it's especially interesting when we think about both Luke and Acts emphasizing that the church is no threat to the Roman Empire. So it almost seems as if Luke is writing Theophilus as a government official to put his mind at ease. So this is Jesus in the book of Luke, and this is Jesus' church over in the book of Acts. And, and neither the Lord nor his church are threats to the empire. You know, Theophilus, as, a, as an official, you do not need to worry about us. We are law-abiding people. Our kingdom is not of this world. We're not out to overthrow the Roman Empire. We don't see that in Luke. We don't see an overthrow of the empire by Christianity in Acts by any means. And we see this especially with Paul. Paul is a Roman citizen, just like you, Theophilus. So there are some parallels here. Um, and, and the ones who are causing these problems are not us as Christians, but it's the Jews doing this. We aren't the ones creating riots. Um, in this letter, notice how Lysias makes himself look really good. Did we notice that? Um, little twist on the truth here. So Lysias makes himself look like the hero of this story. He's praising himself to his superiors. So the Jews tried to kill this man, but I rescued him and I, I brought him to the council. Is that what happened? Hmm, kind of. Um, what did Lysias conveniently leave out of this story? Well, he left out the fact that he ordered Paul to be scourged without a trial as a Roman citizen. Well, we're just kind of ignoring that in this letter. We'll just leave that little part out. Uh, but instead, the commander is the one who saves the day. You know, me with my amazing wisdom and skill, I came in and saved this man from a riot since he was a citizen. Well, that's not exactly the order that went down. Um, it's kind of the truth in a little bit in a way, but it's, it's definitely not the whole truth. It's the truth kind of rearranged out of chronological order. Um, so this man was about to be killed by the Jews, but having ascertained he was a Roman, I rescued him. Not exactly. So uh, Lysias rescued Paul to prevent a riot, to save his own skin as the guy in charge of this whole thing. Then he ordered Paul to be scourged, and only then did he find out that Paul was a Roman. So that's the proper order. So Lysias has it out of order here, but he's trying to make himself look good to his higher-ups. Well, he did, though, bring him to the council. That is an accurate statement here. His conclusion, based on Paul's defense before the council, listening in on this in verse 29, I found him to be accused over questions about their law, but under no accusation deserving death or imprisonment. And that's very interesting. Uh, the commander concludes... Not being a Jewish man, he's looking in on this from the outside and he's saying this is really an internal conflict for the Jews to work out. Paul has done nothing wrong according to Roman law. So as a Roman citizen, he's good to go. We can let him go. And so it's, it's kind of similar to Jesus, isn't it? Uh, three times, I think it was, Pilate declared Jesus to be innocent. This man has done nothing deserving of death over and over again. And that's about what we're finding here. Paul does not deserve to be imprisoned. And in the last few verses, we learn that he's in custody for his own safety. So it's not because he's broken the law. This is for his own good. Uh, there's this plot against him. Therefore, I'm sending him to you to allow you to sort this out. Uh, the commander has also instructed his accusers to bring the charges uh, against him before Felix. I'm almost thinking from a, from a leadership point of view, he's thinking it kind of might go away at this point. If I send him... 24-hour uh, journey away, and I force the Jews to kind of make formal charges. Maybe they'll think twice about this and drop it. I'm, I'm kind of imagining this might be going through his mind. Uh, but the situation uh, is being taken out of Jerusalem for Paul's own safety. That, that we know for sure. Uh, today, we would think maybe about a defendant asking for a change of venue. So because he can't get a fair trial in the community where the alleged crime takes place, things are skewed, it's not going to be fair no matter what happens, that kind of reasoning... And that seems fairly close to what's going on here. Um, in Jerusalem, Paul will get murdered. And that can't be good. He can't have that going down on his watch as a commander. So the authorities get him out of Jerusalem uh, to a far more secure location. So uh, let's move on tonight. Acts 23, uh, 31 through 35. So Acts 23, 31 through 35. So the soldiers, in accordance with their orders, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. But the next day, leaving the horsemen to go on with him, they returned to the barracks. When these had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. 
When he had read it, he asked from what province he was, and when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing after your accusers arrive also, giving orders for him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. On the map, Antipatris is just over halfway from Jerusalem to Caesarea. So again, Caesarea, 68 miles to the northwest, and Antipatris is about 38 miles. So just over half, almost two-thirds of the way up there. So once they get Paul out of the immediate danger in Jerusalem, they take him in the middle of the night. I think some of the commentaries were speculating about 9 o'clock at night. And so they're traveling through the night, kind of a surprise, immediately get him out of here before anything can happen. Once they get to Antipatris, which was something of a, a fortress for the Romans, the horsemen continue on with Paul. The rest of the soldiers on foot return back to the barracks in Jerusalem. Uh, this, by the way, is now the second time that Paul has been snuck out of a city by night. And that's kind of interesting to me. So the first was Damascus, if you remember that. Shortly after his conversion, he was let down through a hole in the city wall by the disciples there, through a, a hole going down the rope in a basket or whatever. Uh, but now he is accompanied by 470 Roman soldiers, so this overwhelming show of force. Uh, once they make it to Caesarea, they deliver Paul to the governor. The Roman historian Tacitus describes Felix by saying, He exercised the power of a king with the mind of a slave. You don't want a leader doing that. Um, uh, some speculation has been that he was a former slave and that somehow he ended up as governor. So I don't know the details of that, but Tacitus, the Roman historian, in summarizing the rule of Felix, said that he exercised the power of a king with the mind of a slave. So Felix learns Paul is from Cilicia, and he keeps Paul in prison as they wait for his accusers to show up. So he is imprisoned in Herod's Praetorium. In the fairly recent past, archaeologists have uncovered the floor of the main gathering hall in Herod's Praetorium in Caesarea. I would love to make it here someday. I don't know if I ever will, but it would be interesting to stand in this place. But I'm, I'm putting a picture on the screen here thanks to Farrell Jenkins. He has a blog with a lot of uh, travel pictures from that part of the world. Uh, but this is almost certainly the exact place where Paul was imprisoned and where he faces his accusers over the coming chapters here. So I'm sure we'll get back to this. Uh, this was also the place where King Herod, Herod Antipas, was eaten by worms and died. Remember that? I think back in chapter 12, thereabouts, when he took the, you know, the, the voice of a god, not the voice of a man, and thank you, thank you very much, and then he died by being eaten by worms. This is the place where that happened. Uh, Caesarea is also the town where Cornelius was baptized, so uh, Paul has been here, or Peter has been here before, and Paul has also been here before. We'll get back to this next week. Uh, but for now, I do find it interesting that once again, we have an actual place that's tied to a series of events in the book of Acts. This is, this is not a once upon a time in a land far, far away kind of story. It's not a, I was talking to somebody on, on Sunday about referring to accounts in the Bible, not as stories, but as accounts. And somebody kind of, not, kind of nicely corrected me on that. You know, I talked about the story of Peter doing this or whatever. Well, in a way it's a story, but uh, in a sense, it's more of an account, isn't it? It's not a made up story. So not a big deal there. But anyway, I just kind of caught myself here, but uh, it's an actual place that we can go, we can visit, we can touch the stones where uh, Paul once stood. So it's an actual place that we can still visit today. And uh, that's where we kind of come to the end of our text for tonight. Paul is in Caesarea. He's imprisoned in Herod's Praetorium, waiting for his accusers to arrive from Jerusalem so that Felix can figure out what in the world he needs to do to fix this situation. Um, as we wrap it up tonight, I want to mention that the last time Paul was here in Caesarea, he was on his way home from his third missionary journey. And you may remember back in Acts 21, he stayed at the home of Philip the Evangelist. So he was one of the seven servants from Acts 6. And it was in Caesarea that we have the second prophecy from Agabus. And uh, this is back a few chapters, and I know this isn't in sequence, but let's go back. If you have your Bible still open, you may want to turn back to Acts 21, 8 through 14. I'll just put that on the screen here. But let's notice that what happened in our class tonight, what we studied tonight from Acts 23, was actually predicted back in Acts chapter 21. So this is Acts 21, 8 through 14. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea. And entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. 
As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, the will of the Lord be done. So the prophecy from Agabus back in Acts 21 has now been fulfilled, hasn't it? Paul has been bound in Jerusalem. He's been taken into custody. He's been delivered into the hands of the Gentiles, just as Agabus predicted sometime earlier. But Paul was willing to do this. He did this voluntarily. He could have booked it from Caesarea, gone to a far off island and retired, but he didn't. He made his way to Jerusalem. That was in the plan. Uh, so Paul was willing. The will of the Lord be done. And certainly the Lord's will is being done here. He's arranging for Paul to go and visit the city of Rome. So tonight, though, we've finished our study of Acts 23. I think now we truly understand the heading in the ABCs of Acts, waiting to kill Paul. Forty men are waiting to kill Paul. And I guess they are still waiting, aren't they? I kind of wonder how that went down. We kind of we're, we're left hanging on that one. We don't know. Um, obviously, they didn't kill Paul. I kind of don't think that they starved to death. I, I think they probably had to give up on their vow. That's my personal opinion. We aren't told. But their plot has been foiled by a young man, a child, Paul's nephew. Uh, more accurately, we might say their, their plot has been foiled by God working through Paul's young nephew. Uh, one practical lesson I take away from this chapter is that God can use those who are very young in powerful, powerful ways. What if this young man had not had the courage to step up? What would have happened? How could this chapter have been different? That's an amazing thing for me to think about. But I think the point is, uh, God can use any one of us if we're willing. If we do what we know to be the right thing to do, just as this young man did. And now his courage is recorded in the Bible for the rest of time. And that's an amazing thing to think about this young man. I think a lot of us know people who are 10, 11, 12 years old. And just to think that uh, somebody in that position really saved Paul's life here and really changed the uh, course of world history and the course of Christianity by keeping Paul alive and uh, not allowing him to be killed there in Jerusalem. It could have all been over right here, but instead Paul lives to tell the story, and he lives to write more books of the New Testament. Thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope you could be uh, present for worship on Sunday, either at 9 or 11. Plan on joining us between those two services for a Bible study at 10. And let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. But uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, the King of kings and the Lord of all lords. We have seen your powerful hand at work behind the scenes in Acts chapter 23 tonight. You used one of the most powerful armies of all time in all of world history to protect your servant Paul. And you did it through the courage of one young man. Thank you, Father. We ask that you would use us in similar ways. We pray for courage to follow you even more closely and more carefully than we have ever before in the past. Thank you for making us a part of your kingdom, the church. We're thankful for the support of Christian friends. You have been so good to us as your people. Thank you for making us a part of the Four Lakes congregation. We pray that we might be able to represent you well in the Madison area. Use us in any way that you see fit. In Jesus we pray. Amen.